start off with if there is any public comment on any of the agenda items for the day. You may, yeah, there'll be public comment at the end of the comment that has been uh, discussed during the meetings. Seeing none, I don't believe we have any agenda actions from the. Uh, from the no, I'll, I'll bring up my, my matters as part of my report. Very good. Okay. May I please have a motion for the approval of the minutes from the September board meeting? Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Um, you have in front of you the uh, Chief Financial Officer's report. Um, there are items A, B, C, D, E, C, various reports. Are there any questions or comments on those reports? Seeing none, received and filed. Uh, item F, we have a request for the ratification of the expenditures and wires. May um, I have a motion, please? Is there a second? Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments on that? Seeing none, then we have a roll call vote, please. Mr. Andrew Hall? Yes. Mr. Butler? Yes. Ms. Wenzel? Yes. Dr. Lewis West? Yes. Mr. McGann? Yes. Mr. Sheldon? Yes. Mrs. Smith? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Solicitor. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, we had a court hearing yes, yesterday with Judge Angelus. Currently, there are 11 litigation matters. There are four underlying cases, the trust case, the operating case, the Sunshine Act case, and the, the city's case. Um, I'm trying to exercise control over the authority's operations. Um, the seven appeals have all been filed by the, by the city of Chester. As the judge has, over the past few months, made uh, decisions forbidding the city from moving forward on RFPs and for, for forbidding them from trying to act in our operations, uh, they have appealed each of his decisions. So there, there have been a seven. Uh, the court action yesterday, I believe, was on the city's motions to dissolve all injunctions. Uh, the judge heard a testimony from uh, myself, from Brian McEwen and Agnes Weppenberg. I want to thank both, both, both of them for their, their efforts. They did a great job. Uh, and we would expect a decision with him uh, within the next couple of days. The issue before him yesterday is the city believes that all the injunctions should be dissolved and uh, they should be allowed to move forward with more RFPs trying to uh, sell the, the Chester Water Authority. And the authority argued to the court that we need specific permission from the judge to allow us to undertake borrowing. Uh, it was suggested by the city's attorney in his closing comments that uh, the authority uh, not be allowed to borrow money, but it instead should look towards either raising rates or um, uh, cutting uh, uh, services or, or cutting staff or deferring maintenance. But uh, I think it would be beneficial to our rate payers if we were to post the transcript, which includes his closing remarks and has already been ordered in We'll try to do that soon. Um, so that'll, that'll, that'll be up in, in the next couple of days. Uh, on, a, on a positive note, we've been asked by uh, the government of Chester County to allow them to use the same law firm that we use, Eckert Siemens, uh, because they want to join in our support, in, in support of us in the, uh, the, uh, the trust case. Uh, because we've used Eckerd in the past for litigation matters and because we currently use, use them as bond counsel, uh, they wanted us to address the issue of potential for a, a conflict of interest arising from them representing both Chester County and, and us. There is no conflict of interest now. They will be getting into the trust case on the same side as the Chester Water Authority and supporting the, the relief uh, that we are asking for to be allowed to transfer certain of the various property in, into the trust. Um, the, the reason for the conflict waiver is to allow them to get involved in, in the case and to indicate our understanding that if there ever is a difference in their position, um, that they would, the Eckerd firm would have to get out of the case representing Chester County, but we would still be allowed to continue using the Eckerd firm as a, as a bond counsel. Um, so uh, I would ask the board to formally vote to waive that that conflict, I think that's, that's in our interest and I would welcome them as our, as our partners in that, that application. Ben, have a, a motion please? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any comments or questions regarding this? Seeing none, uh, Sandy, would you do a roll call please? Mr. Andrew Yes. Mr. Butler? Yes. Ms. Lancel? Yes. Dr. Lewis West? Yes. Mr. McGann? Yes. 
Yes. Mr. Shelton? Yes. Mrs. Smith? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Schlosser. Um, and as far as uh, movement on the equipment from Mr. Bur Burkett, uh, I did actually see him yesterday. The, the city attorneys uh, requested the attendance of all board, board members, all Chester and Woodward 34 board members, last, last week to a, attend yesterday's hearing. Uh, they amended that request at 6 p.m. the night before the, uh, the hearing to only require Mrs. Leisel to, uh, to, to come. Mr. Burkett didn't get that information. Uh, he came anyway. Um, I'd like to thank Mr. Mr. Shelton, Mrs. Mrs. Smith, and Doc Tucker West for, for coming and, and, and sitting through the, uh, the hearing. Um, I think we went on from nine until about three, four. Uh, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was a very, very full, full day and a pretty full courtroom. Um, I think there was a count of 15 lawyers, 17 lawyers. 17 lawyers, lawyers present, uh, not counting me. Uh, so uh, that's that's where, where we are. We're, we're looking for the judge's decision as to whether he's going to dissolve the injunctions and allow the city to go forward on a new RFP, or he's going to support <coughs> our request that we be specifically allowed to undertake the borrowing that we pre previously approved in 2019 that allowed us close. That was $35 million for our, our capital program for 
question, but I have a nice one uh, as to why the board found itself in a position after the reappointment of the board members that happened in 2017. Uh, we didn't know until 2019 that uh, uh, one of our workers worked for a firm that uh, uh, was doing work for Aqua, who has uh, who had been filed suit uh, against us. Uh, there are really two ways to address that sort of issue. The board and management, uh, certain man management of the Chester Water Authority is governed by the State Ethics Act. And one of those requirements every year is that we, we have to file a statement of financial interest with the board secretary at the office. The other is we, we need to be guided by certain prohibitions as to the conduct that we, we can in, engage in. And if there is a conflict issue, Sometimes that has to be publicly stated, and uh, there has to be a memorandum filed when we've addressed that issue. So I've given letters to board members uh, over the years as to uh, whether or not something is a conflict that would require abstention from, from voting and, and what is it. Uh, it's been my experience that this board, as long as I've been involved with it, has been very diligent in, in uh, understanding and implementing the requirements of that, that act. People don't participate in deliberations of matters that they have an interest in, and they don't vote for matters that they, they have an, 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 an interest in. Um, and we're very diligent about that. So it was, it was unfortunate that we found ourselves in a situation in 2019 that that issue had arisen. There are two ways to address that issue. One is that we could adopt hard and fast rules saying that if anybody if any new or prospective board member has an, an affiliation with uh, a company like Aqua that's in a position where they're trying to do a hospital takeover of us, they'd be prohibited from serving. Uh, that would also that could also be drafted to cover existing board members that would develop um, to develop some relationship with them during the time of their service. But my my recommendation is that we go back to doing what we did in 2012, and and, and that is that. And what, what we do now is we have a conversation either individually or collectively uh, amongst ourselves, usually with me, about whether or not uh, a certain relationship or a certain in, in employment or a certain involvement rises to the level of a, of a conflict. We should have that discussion before any new person comes on, on the board. Uh, back in 2012, we had that conversation as a board at our very first meeting and unanimously voted to go to court to test whether or not one of the appointees was eligible to serve. Uh, I would suggest that we go back to that rather than posting a hard and fast set of rules. There are existing rules now, it's just a question of applying them. And when, you know, when there were reappointments made and, and some people that weren't on the board in 2012 came on the board in 2017, they were not part of that scrutiny because frankly it was assumed that the appointing authority had, had done that. For, for whatever reason that, that, that didn't happen, my suggestion is rather than adopt a hard and fast set of additional rules, that this board rely upon the State Ethics Act and that we require a procedure where any new board member gets vetted by the board or by a committee of, of, the, of the board with the assistance of the appropriate professional to make sure that that new prospective member understands what their obligations are under the, the Ethics Act and to have that conversation and to give them the opportunity to be in the same position that the uh, seven of you are. That is to have the discussion before the vote, to have the discussion before the, the deliberation to make sure that situation doesn't happen again. So we should undertake as a board that responsibility. My suggestion would be to address the issue that way. I don't think any kind of vote is necessary now. I just need to hear some, some sense of where, where the, uh, the, uh, the board is, and I'll, I'll communicate that to all appointing authorities. Does uh, any members of the board, do any members of the board have a comment regarding this or opinion that they'd like to express? Just a Frank, you said you would transmit the thought to all of the appointing authorities. Yes. And, and the communication would, would be that we appreciate whatever review you do as an appointing authority. We have our own process. We want to make sure that new board members have an appreciation and an understanding as to how seriously this board takes its obligations under the State Ethics Act. And here's what you need to think about. You know, here are the kinds of issues that come before us regularly. And if you have an affiliation with any business, 
or uh, or any 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 relationship that might come under that, you know, you should disclose that now so that you talk about it now before you take your seat, because there might be something that that may interfere with what you currently do that may prohibit you from serving. So that should be done before a person takes their seat, as it was done in 2012. Uh, a devil's advocate for it. Yes. It's the responsibility of the appointing authorities, either Chester County or Delaware County or the city of Chester, to do the appointment. Yes. So they appoint. Down comes the candidate, and the candidate, for whatever reason, doesn't pass our muster. So we respond back to the appointing authority and say, no, this person has a conflict, or this person has this or that. And if the, what, where do we go if the response comes back? <coughs> it's within our authority to make an appointment. That's our appointee. The way we handled that question in 2012 is the way that I think you should handle it now. My <coughs> advice would be but, to do the but, same thing as we did in 2012. Yes, yes. And that was an issue where there was an interpretation of the section of the statute that required you to live in the service area. It was a geography. It was a geography. Correct. Correct. Individual wasn't living in the geographic boundary. Correct. Correct. And I had talked to one of the city solicitors at that time. And their belief was that they had a good faith argument that that person qualified. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Uh. So what, what I'll, I'll do then with the, with the, the consent <coughs> of, of the board is to communicate, com communicate to the appointing authorities that we have our own process now where we have an on onboarding process as we, we did in 2020. Should we memorialize that uh, process uh, for our records? Well, we actually have forms that we used in 2012, so I'll reintroduce those to, to the uh, plenty of our Sure. Thank you. Uh, other board matters? Mr. McGinn? Of course. Thank you, Madam Chairman. If you recall, last month I made a pledge to our ratepayers and my fellow board members that I was going to be talking about two things, probably until we get this matter resolved. And one of them was, is what this board has been doing to protect our customers, and the second is the consequences of allowing the attempt of a hostile takeover of this assault, if this was to succeed. So I'm going to concentrate on that today. So last month I said to you that we had saved the ratepayers $90 million. I checked on the website today, and that number is at $94 million. And, you know, we all talk about where our numbers come from, and we can all skew our numbers. So rather than saying that and Aqua says that their numbers, my numbers are crazy, and I say their numbers are crazy, whatever the case may be. So I did a little research, and I went on our website, and I found an article uh, selling out of consumers, and this is done by the uh, uh, Food and Water Watch. So I'm going to say this is a neutral party. So I'm going to start off by saying that my numbers might be wrong according to this article because my numbers were based on our rates doubling. But as I go through this a little bit, I'm going to explain to you that from this article it says that our rates probably would triple. So I might have been wrong on that. And I found, uh, so it says that, uh, that uh, our water prices would increase after 10, after 10 of the largest water supply sales for prop, two profit companies between 1991 and 2011. I know this is a little old, a little dated, but I think it follows the same theme. Out of the 10, I'm just concentrating on four of those because these four were all purchased by Aqua. Ben Salem, Pennsylvania, Bristol, Pennsylvania, Media, Pennsylvania, and Westchester, Pennsylvania. And the article states, by, and I quote, by 2011, after an average of 11 years of private control water bills in these communities, all of them nearly tripled on average. End 
quote. Under private ownership, oil rates grew at an average of about three times the rate of inflation, averaging an increase of about 18% every year. The article also reads that AquaPA seeks, and I'm quoting now, seeks to increase the rate of its new customers over time to the level it charges its main service division. At the same time, it also hikes the rates of its main division so that the new purchases need even more steeper increases to be equalized." End quote. The article concludes that communities need local public control of their water and sewer utilities to protect the public interest and to ensure that no one goes without this essential public resource. So I point out to you, the time is ticking. It's ticking on all of us. And the voice of the ratepayers need to be heard. The question is, why should CWA be sold to Chester City, too many Chesters in here, so that we can provide the city with cash? I'm not, I don't favor selling the authority to provide Del Delaware County with cash. Delaware County, Chester County, nor the city of Chester ever put any cash into the Chester Water Authority from its conception. When the Chester Water Authority was, was developed, it was done through a bond issue. The ratepayers paid that bond issue. So none of the authorities that we have, none of the municipalities that we're talking about, the two counties in the city, ever put any skin in the game. So what does that mean? It means that all the assets belong to the ratepayers, not to any of the governing parties. The ratepayers need, need to let the local, their local governing bodies know. They need to let the county know. They need to let their state representatives and their senators know. And they need to let the governor know. And they need to do it now, before our terms on this board run out, we have new board members in here, or the politicians in Harrisburg have an opportunity to change the rules on how, how our authority is run. Remember, the time is ticking. We need to act as rate payers. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McGinn. If there's any uh, new business or old business that anyone would like to discuss. Seeing none, it's time for public comment. Uh, Blair Fleischman, Oxford. Um, just attending uh, court yesterday, there was testimony presented having to do with the cost of the Camp, uh, Camp Tweedale Girl Scout property by the Chester Water Authority. It would have been in 2016. And the amount that was given to the attorney for Aqua seemed to be an incorrect number from what I understood. I'm not sure of the significance of that. I guess it's up to the judge to decide maybe. But so that's sort of one thing. And then Mr. Catania just mentioned um, uh, Chester <coughs> County and their um, desire to uh, have joint support of the trust case. So I guess I just wanted clarification. When the Chester Water Authority, you know, appealed to the court to try to put their assets in trust. So would the, can you define those assets? Would those be the real assets, the infrastructure assets? The, are the customers considered an asset too? And if Chester County is looking to, have, to participate to the extent that some of us citizens would like to see them participate to defend all of that, the Chester Water Authority in general, um, is there a chance that they would only be taking a position on one aspect of those assets, like the real estate or the infrastructure, and maybe not the customers? Um, are you, I don't know if you're at liberty to say, but you also talked about if there was a difference that you could part ways and that you would still uh, retain the Eckert firm or whatever. Um, 
and just go on to Chester County would no longer. So could you just give us some clarification about the trust case and which assets those would be, but then also maybe speak to the value of the Camp Tweedell property and how that, what significance that might be because the Aqua attorney was, um, my take on it was that there was an implication that the Chester Water Authority had lots of cash laying around to buy assets just like that. So. Um, can you speak to any of that? Sorry. Yes, sure. Um, <coughs> the question was, was asked by, by Joel, Joel Frank. Uh, Joel Frank, at, in 2013, was representing the Chester Water Authority. He, he represented the Chester Water Authority in its sale of uh, the Brookhaven parcel uh, that is now soon to be the home of uh, uh, Chick-fil-A, uh, uh, amongst other places. But my recollection was that, that property was sold for about $5 million. He represented the, the Chester Water Authority in that transaction. He appeared before Brookhaven Borough um, for the zoning of uh, approvals representing us and so on. So he was aware of how much money the authorities received in proceeds uh, from that, that sale. Uh, my under, under, under understanding is that that money was then put into a separate ac account and the money from Kent Tweedell came out of that account. I think wow. that, that, that the answer that we heard in was $4.5 million. It was actually, I think, between 1.2 and 1.4. I think the actual purchase price might have been closer to 1.2, and then there were, there were some other costs that, that may have boosted that up. But uh, the testimony as to what happened was not what actually happened. Uh, I don't think it's going to matter much for that, for the decision in, in, the, in the court, but we will have the opportunity to, to address that should the judge rely upon that. In his decision, but I don't think that's that's the issue that was being organized. That was more anecdotal. There was a series of cross-examination questions asked of our witness, suggesting that we should, you know, lay off people, stop paying managers so much money, um, you know, things things like that. We will post all of those questions uh, and the transcript of the of the full hearing on the website when we get it, either either tomorrow or a, or a, or Monday. But. Uh, the actual pur purchase price came out of the sale of a capital asset, um, and I'm pretty sure it was 1.2. Mr. Andrew was involved in those negotiations with me. I think the original ask was 1.4. Uh, the Scouts were including what they were selling us uh, through, I'm sure, the innocent oversight of land that we already owned. Uh, we backed that out of the purchase price. We didn't want to pay for something we already owned, so uh, it, it got re reduced to around as far as Chester County goes, we received a call last week to uh, consider allowing Chester County to um, use the same lawyers that we use because they expressed a desire to get involved in the trust litigation. Now, the trust litigation is simply this board's adoption of a trust instrument, which included a gen the generic description of the assets that were going to be transferred into the trust. They were the generation, storage, and transmission <coughs> assets, but not the distribution assets. At the time of the hearing, there would be a specific delineation of what assets go, go where, but generation, storage, and transition means generally all of the property out at, at the plant plus the plant operations, transmission line running up Route, route 1, the, the uh, storage tanks both in Chester County and in Delaware County distribution lines and the distribution assets are more local local things. So I'm sure that when we proceed to a hearing, we'll be, we'll be required to uh, list those specifically. But we're not quite there yet. And we would, of, well, of course, do that under, under, under seal for trade, trade secret and you know, business, business privilege reasons. Um, but when Chester County gets involved in the case, what that, that means is they're going to support our request that we be allowed transfer of those assets into the trust, and then enter into a lease agreement where the authority continues to exist, can, continues to run operations, and leases those assets back from the trust. You didn't say, though, the real estate doesn't have any uh, transmission or distribution line. So what all, 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 of, all of the real estate that we own is involved in either generation storage or transmission, with the exception of the, of the, of the headquarters and the, and the property on the Delaware River. 
they would probably both be put in, into the uh, trust to. How about the old Oh, all, all, all the, yeah. The, the purpose of buying the, the land around the reservoir, right, the water. reservoir sits down in yeah. a little, 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 little bit of a valley. Uh, there have been some problems over, over the years with people using uh, land around there where there have been slides of, uh, of uh, offensive material, and we would want to reduce that. We don't need any of that in, in the reservoir. It, it, it dramatically uh, affects water quality. So there was a, a decision made for operational reasons years ago to purchase all the land around the authority to protect the integrity of the water there. So that is a generation asset. But it would be specifically listed. So if Chester County is going to join in the case, yep. they would be joining in and asking for the same relief that we're asking for. That is permission to transfer all the assets that I just indicated into the trust, and then to allow the trust to enter into an operating agreement where the authority continues to exist and continues to run things just as they are, but simply own the distribution assets. The trust will own everything else. Thank you. Uh, just a point of clarification to those wondering why the actual purchase price was somewhat lower than the, uh, than the original thought. During uh, our due diligence, we found 16 acres of ground that was originally an hours to begin with. The parcel was, was offered at 108 acres, and that was the reason for the top price. Through the due diligence, we found out that 16 of the 108 uh, were ours to begin with, that over the years we allowed the, the organization that owned the place to, to use that from water fires. So you back that 16 out of the 108, you come up with an actual 92 acres, not 108. And that's the reason for the couple hundred thousand dollars difference in actual purchase price versus well, just since I don't know that you were there, but just yesterday, I was like hearing 4.5 versus 1.5 million, and I just thought it was a significant yeah, yeah. And, it, and I didn't pick up on the Brookhaven uh, aspect of it, so um, it's very confusing. <laughs> Sorry. But, it, but, the, but the number that was presented <coughs> in the context, I thought was significant, so. Yeah, yeah, the number started at 104, and I think come in at about 170 or 102 in that, or a million two in that, in that range. Yeah. Any other? Yes, please. Hi, Peggy Ann Russell, resident of Oxford Borough. Um, just hearing the words reduce the staff just runs chills up my spine. Uh, and I am all of a sudden looking at two scenarios. If you make these hardworking, dedicated, loyal employees, uh, and you take some of them and cut them back to part time, we're going to lose experienced professionals because they're not going to be able to afford to work part time. And if you, in fact, cut positions, you are then <coughs> not cutting the workload. So you are overworking and causing all of this extra time and probably overtime. It, it, that whole thing doesn't make sense, and I can't wait to read the transcript of that. I, I just want to see that in writing because I, it's hard to believe anybody would be that thoughtless about our water. Um, the second <coughs> thing is that I had an opportunity to call Commissioner Kazone's office about something else uh, last week, and yesterday they, the administrative assistant returned a call um, with information about the first item. And I reminded her that the residents of Oxford were very concerned about the sale of the Chester Water Authority. Reminded her, asked her to remind Kathy that, you know, we do get one third of our water from you and that we know what's going to happen. And then I said to her, um, please ask Kathy to push for the appointment on the board because you have nothing to lose now. 
because she's not a, a candidate on the ballot. And I said, please try to push for it before the election. Now, I know the election is very close, but I think that it's important for that office to know that some of us think that perhaps that's not being pushed because there is an election. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Anyone else care to address the board? Any further comments by the board? Just a thought, maybe, regarding the suggestions to do away with help or cut down on hours. Yeah, that's an easy thing to articulate from the confines of the court room. Thank you. You're absolutely I, right. I hope that makes your By the clueless. Articulated by the clueless. Yeah. 